Hey everybody, Chris Farad here. Welcome back to Amnesia Machine for Pigs. So we left off here, we were at the top of these ominous stairs. After going through like some type of graveyard, and then we've gone we've gone through a lot. Now we're gonna head down and see what's going on in the piston rooms. I don't know why my lamp is flickering. But there's nothing that I can do about it, it seems. Woo! Okay. That definitely... Uh... We've seen that thing a few times now. I almost wonder if if my lamp is doing that because it's I don't know. I wonder if it does that around danger. Or I have to put it away for a bit, I'm not sure. Perhaps we'll never know. We've seen those little mutant things. Shit. The lights are mimicking my lamp now. This is not getting any better. We've seen those little mutant things a few times. And although it's at this point kind of unclear as to why they're around, it's clear that they are not friendly. So this, this guy's been leading us for a while now. But he's kind of leading from the shadows. We have no clue who he is, he's not giving us any information, and we're not asking questions anymore either. October 17th, 1899. Each compartment is ergonomically designed with a feed trough at one end so the product naturally settles into a position ready for the stunning arms to connect to the skull. We use the natural static charge built up by the friction of the carts against the belt to build an electrical charge, which is contained within glass vacuum canisters at the sides of the stunning arm mechanisms and delivered along the stun arms via copper cabling. We've observed that the artificial light lightning contained within these canisters seems to calm the product further. Post-stunning, the line tilts sharply to the vertical, the physics of which tips the stun product upwards to fall directly in onto the hook of the bleeding line. This hook passes normally through the haunch or thigh of the product, and from this point we dispense with the belt and instead instigate a channeled floor, which creates a funnel allowing blood and byproduct excretions to collect and run to the fluid collection tanks. we are getting pretty graphic in their detailing of this machine. The only problem is they're not just coming out and saying exactly what it is. Or I'm not, I should say, considering I wrote most of these notes. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping that run into that thing again.
Okay, so that's furnace number one. Furnace number two, though. Do we need to put more coal inside? Perhaps. Whoa, okay. I didn't expect that to actually do anything. Furnace is fueled. Yes, they are. Something else isn't right still. Two, four, six. One, three, five. Oh, we have six furnaces to deal with, it looks like. A series of collecting vents have been installed along the ceiling at this stage of the line. In the process of stunning and bleeding, the product often expels stinking vapors from its digestive system, which can be collected, condensed, and used in the methane boiler to drive the engine as a whole. In this way, the more product is processed, the more power becomes available to the machine, and productivity is actually increased. A simple stroke of genius, but one that encapsulates the benefits of self-regulatory automation. So by processing these things, these pigs that we've been finding, uh, their excrement is being used to be turned into fuel to power the machine that's doing the processing, which is actually fairly genius. Okay, so we need to turn on six and three. Now, how much is required? I'm not sure, but the last one I put f four in. Maybe I didn't need to. Five is good. Six isn't, though. Is that enough to run it? No, it's not. Lily's arms are made of steel. Lily's arms are silent. The pistons are silent. The plant is at rest. What? I must poke the hornet's nest to open my way, I fear. The scale of these engines suggests a far greater works than is visible from the surface, so my friend must be correct, and the larger part of this plant is underground. We are close to the Thames. No wonder flooding is such a risk. Lily's... So Lily is also the name of my wife, and perhaps we name the machine after her? Or perhaps the whole time... It's just been the machine, but... But that can't be because we... The fires are stoked, assuming the same architect is responsible here as with the chemical plant. I surmise that a centralized control system regulates and operates the pistons. Should be a simple matter of finding it and hoping the saboteur relented after simply extinguishing the fires. Son of a bitch, another pickhead. I don't like 
like this at all right now. Oh. Instantly sweating. Okay. Things are starting to get real here. Hear something walking towards me? Oh God! Oh, leave! sure where I can go to get out of here, but... Oh. oh. The descent continues. What did that dark voice instruct me to do? Under the pistons, into the tunnels, and on the builds of the pumps. 
And if the doors should be locked, I will have to find another means of descent. I cannot trust him, but my path is set. I shall ignore those noises, that snuffling, those shuffling steps below me. I will brave whatever lurks beneath, and I will save them. Of course, referring to Edwin and Enoch. April 30th, 1899. The crate arrived this morning, and I had it delivered directly to the workshop. The body is remarkably preserved, although there is a subtle yet nauseating stench of damp and rot. It is humanoid in shape, but has suffered severe skeletal deformity. Remnants of leather straps encase the torso, which is, it, which is deformed, with evidence of substantial muscle mass and displacement. It is difficult to ascertain whether this unfortunate is the recipient of some barbarous surgery or was born deformed in an attempt to force his gnarled body into some semblance of humanity was made. What he is, I cannot tell, but I smell the orb upon him and suspect my great uncle's presence in his curious condition. So it can be done. We can reshape the body into a tool, accelerate the processes of Mr. Darwin's evolution. But here my great uncle and I part company. He chose men as the subjects of his experiments, but men are difficult to control and rotten with sentimentality. No, we require a new creature for our chattels. Loyal, clever, strong, easily sated. So this is describing that those things that are walking around, these deformed... I don't know what they are. Uh, but I can smell the orb on him, which is still referencing that thing that we had found. At some point. Uh, back in Mexico. No naked flames. What? See that? It ran this way, but there's nothing... Chemical transportation, danger, highly corrosive, highly flammable. Maybe this is how we're going to transfer around. In the nest of eggs, it is cradled in his sweating hands. It sucks the fever loose from his body. He dreams of birds far above in the jungle canopy. A jaguar coughing at the dawn. Ha <laughs> 